My name is Connor Goodwin, and I'm ProPublico's Interim Director of Communications. Welcome to How Journalists Can Report on Toxic Hotspots. For those new to us, ProPublico is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. Earlier this month, we published a groundbreaking map that showed the spread of cancer-causing air pollution from industrial facilities into nearby neighborhoods. Now, we'd like to empower journalists across the country to use this new tool to illuminate the risks their communities face and to hold government and industrial facilities accountable for pollution problems. Today's webinar is brought to you in partnership with the Society of Environmental Journalists and with support from McKinsey & Company. Now, allow me to introduce a few members of the reporting team behind this first of its kind project. Ava Kaufman reports on technology for ProPublica. She was previously a contributing reporter at The Intercept. Layla Yunus is a news app developer for, for ProPublica's local reporting network. She was previously a data reporter with the New York Public Radio and Gothamist. Maya Miller is also an engagement reporter with ProPublica's local reporting network. She works with journalists across the country on community-centered investigations. Our moderator today is Alex Zayas. Alex is an assistant managing editor at ProPublica, running a team of reporters and coordinating across the newsroom to enhance its special projects. Stories she edited have won two National Magazine Awards, two George Polk Awards, and the Pulitzer Prize for feature writing. Before I hand it off, I want to note that the session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed tomorrow to everyone who registered. And once again, if you have a question, please click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type it there. Thanks again for joining us. I'll let Alex take it from here. Hey everyone, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I see the numbers of uh, attendees climbing. I'm super excited uh, to have you here. Um, as Connor said, we really want to empower reporters across the country to be able to use this first of its kind tool. Um, our, the reporting that we've done recently um, has led us to believe that the EPA is taking this tool seriously. And we have seen uh, reporters outside of ProPublica who have used this tool get some uh, local impact. Just yesterday, uh, we read a story out of the Ann Arbor News um, in which reporters identified uh, some questionable uh, emissions and uh, state officials jumped on it. So we really want to make this tool something that you're able to use to bring authority to uh, the work you're doing, right? Um, it's, we wanna not just have people saying that they, they feel symptoms and complaining about you know, the pollution around them making them sick. Now we have black and white, some, some risk estimates that will actually show just how much risk people are being exposed to. Um, so without further ado, I wanna, wanna give a little bit more of an introduction to this uh, all-star team here. Layla, uh, who with her uh, partner on the, on the News Apps team, Al, suffered for two years uh, putting, putting this tool together. She will uh, describe for you guys uh, how it works and what you can take from it. And she, along with Ava and Maya, have been uh, talking to a lot of people on the ground have started to do a lot of uh, community reporting and also reporting with government sources so uh, they can answer your questions about that as well. We want to, to make this a dialogue. So please, if you have any questions that pop up, um, throw them in the chat and Connor and I will do our best to get to them. So without further ado, Layla, I'd love to um, have you give us a little walkthrough of the tool. Yes, absolutely. I'm gonna share my screen. Can everyone see it? Okay, great. So, um, yep. So this is what we call the most detailed map of cancer causing industrial air pollution in the US. Um, and at the top here, you see three different hotspots that our analysis identified. Um, this one right here on the left is the most famous one that would be Cancer Alley, Louisiana. Um, in the center here, we have Houston, which we're going to explore together shortly. And then here on the right, um, is an area in Charleston, West Virginia. So I'm going to scroll down to this zoomed in um, really crisp image of what our map looks like when it is zoomed in. What you see here are these individual boxes. We refer to them as grid cells. The model underlying our map and our analysis, it's an EPA model called RSEI-RECI. 
the risk screening environmental indicators model. If you'd like to read more about it, we wrote a very detailed methodology that sort of explains that model and how we um, created these risk estimations using it. What you should know here, however, is that each of the grid cells that the model outputs um, chemical concentrations into are 810 um, by 810 meters that is less than a kilometer wide so what you basically get is a super granular um, view of what's happening on the ground in these communities so um, by using a model at this level of granularity you can actually understand what the risk might be like at the fence line of a facility um, right up here too we show you the range of risk estimates um, the way that risk is talked about in the EPA is in increments of one in X thousand. So this number right here, one in 100,000, means that if a community of 100,000 individuals are continuously exposed to a certain level of industrial pollution over a presumed lifetime of 70 years, um, one person would be expected to develop cancer from that exposure. It's important to note that that cancer risk is getting added on top of the cancer risk that we all already have just by virtue of being humans in the world, having family histories, being exposed to tons of stuff all the time, not just cancer causing air pollution. Um, and so it's important to note that um, none of us start at zero and that um, this incremental lifetime cancer risk from toxic air pollution can be the difference between having a familial history of breast cancer and actually developing breast cancer, for example. Um, the image that you see here is a zoomed in area um, of the Texas Gulf Coast. Um, this right here is one of the most uh, toxic plants that our analysis identified, Huntsman Petrochemical. Um, and so let's now dive into the actual map. So it looks like a map. What it really is is an interactive database. Um, and basically, you can interact with it by clicking around, searching for addresses. Um, we have multiple views on this map. What you see at the top here are a selection of hotspots. So we define a hotspot as a contiguous area of grid cells where the estimated cancer risk is above one in 100,000, um, that risk level that I mentioned um, just above. That level is right in the center of the EPA's um, range of a risk benchmarks of acceptable benchmarks so at the high end of that range is one in ten thousand the epa has said that anything worse than one in ten thousand is unacceptable um, and at the low end of that range is one in one million which is the risk level that many environmental advocates um, believe should be the actual risk level that the epa uses and it is the one that was included in the original um, clean air act um, so let's go ahead and take a look at um, some of the hotspots in the selection up here. Um, I mentioned Houston, Texas, so we can just go there by clicking on it. And so this view that you're looking at right here is the hotspot view. So this is one of the two views in our map. Um, the hotspot view gives you some sort of summary statistics of this hotspot, right? This contiguous area of grid cells with the estimated risk above one in 100,000. So you get the population of people within that hotspot, not within the city, but within the area, right? Um, and it's important to note that some hotspots can cover uh, multiple cities or might um, only exist in a corner of a city. Um, and so uh, we give you the population within that hotspot, so the number of people affected above that cancer risk benchmark. Um, we also tell you what the average risk is within the hotspot. So if you average the estimated risk levels of all the grid square squares within the hotspot, um, this is the average risk. And then we also tell you what the highest risk in the hotspot is. So that would be um, most likely the square that the plant exists in. Um, the other thing that we give you in the um, in the sidebar in the hotspot view are the major facilities that are driving the risk in that hotspot. So I had mentioned Hudson Petrochemical. There it is. Um, Ceylonese and Equistar. All three of these plants are major emitters of the chemical ethylene oxide, which is one of the most chem toxic chemicals emitted uh, by American industry. Our analysis identified it as the most toxic chemical, in fact, um, emitted by 
American industry. So if I want to exit the hotspot view and get into the location specific view, I can do a couple things. I can either search for an address or I can just click within the hotspot. So I'm going to click in the hotspot and now you'll see that what happens, what, what exists within the sidebar has changed. So um, now, as you can see, I have my, this yellow locator icon shows up and it is clicked into the exact location that I had clicked on the map. And so it is basically going to give me information for this particular grid square. Um, the information that it gives me is in the sidebar. It tells me the estimated cancer risk in that particular grid square. So in this case, it is one in 6,800, which is 1.5 times the EPA's level of acceptable risk, which was again, one in 10,000. So basically um, the EPA would consider the estimated cancer risk in this square to be unacceptable, okay? Um, and then of course we show you where that is on the range of uh, risk on this legend right here. Um, this is one of my favorite things that we have in the entire app, which is this little risk over time. I find it incredibly helpful because I think um, a question that um, many readers, myself included, have is, well, is it getting worse here? Is it getting better? Is it staying the same over the five-year period of our analysis? So this can help you to learn about that. Um, and then similar to the hotspot view, you learn about the plants that are driving the risk in this individual grid square. Another really helpful thing I like here that we do is we give you the actual percent contribution uh, on average of each of those plants uh, over the five-year period. So, you know, Equistar Chemical, if you live in this particular grid square is estimated to be contributing 61% of your cancer risk here. Uh, and then we list the chemicals that it is emitting that are driving the majority of that cancer risk. So again, ethylene oxide, um, and um, acetyl aldehyde. I, I, I never pronounce that properly. Um, so um, now let's go ahead and um, do an address search. So I'm going to look up, um, instead of an actual address, I'm just gonna look up a city. So let's go to Memphis, Tennessee. Um, the locator icon usually just gets plopped in the geographic center of whatever place I search for. Um, and then since it's outside of a hotspot, the map prompts me to see the closest hotspot to me. So I click see hotspot and then I am in the hotspot view um, again. So this should look familiar. Um, but again, if I decide that I want to exit the hotspot view and enter the location specific view, I just click within the hotspot. And um, the way to toggle between these two views is just to use this little uh, button up here. So we always include in the location specific view, this is part of a hotspot around Memphis, Tennessee. So I can click back here to kind of zoom back out into the hotspot view. Um, I can also scroll over here and take a look at another um, big polluter in the area, SFI of Tennessee. Um, and then, you know, I'll just call your attention to the fact that as you click around the hotspot, you'll see the risk change. And, um, you know, pretty logically, the further away you get from the location of the plant, um, the risk decreases. So um, one thing that I do find really great about showing um, this granularity and really, you know, seeing the dispersion of the chemicals is that you can understand how the model is actually computing that dispersion, right? Um, the model in takes in all kinds of different inputs, including wind direction and topography, weather modeling data. And so for example, in right here, we can see that because of the topography of the land, because of all these different inputs, um, the pollution is kind of getting blown a little bit more in, in this direction, right? Um, rather than, you know, there, there isn't sort of like an, an equal amount of pollution on all sides of the, you know, epicenter of the plant. Um, so I find that useful um, to learn and, and would, would call your attention towards that. Um, another interesting fact of this plant in particular is that we can see you have pretty low risk um, in these three years, and then you kind of have a jump in 2017. So that's something that I would you know, that would catch my attention if I were reporting on this plant and, um, you know, would possibly, uh, you know, make it or definitely make it into the list of questions that I ask this company and state regulators if I'm reporting on it. Um, another thing that uh, we include here is that um, we kind of have links uh, for each of these chemicals. So if I click on chromium, for example, I am taken to the EPA's um, 
page on Chromium. Iris is um, the EPA sort of toxic chemical database. Um, and this is pretty technical documentation, but we do find it helpful because um, it lists, you know, what the EPA considers, what parts of the body the EPA considers this chemical to affect. And um, it is important, of course, when you're sort of reporting on a plant and you're trying to find individuals who uh, are potentially affected by that plant to make sure that the health effects they claim to have sort of align with the ones that are caused by the chemicals in the area. So um, that's why we uh, sort of offer these chemical resources. And there are obviously other places that you can learn about these chemicals, but um, we think that iris is a really good first step. Um, and I will just, for fun, go to one other location um, that we are all familiar with. Um, let's go to Chicago. Chicago is an interesting city. It's sort of dotted with all sorts of um, tiny hotspots, and you can just click around to the different ones of them and learn about them um, and see um, how their risks have changed over time. Uh, it's also useful to note that some of our hotspots are truly only one grid cell wide. Um, that's because that is the only grid cell um, that none of the other grid cells around it are estimated to have a cancer risk greater than one in 100,000. Um, and so, yeah, I, I want to ask now, um, my colleagues, if there's anything that I missed here or that I should be explaining that I have forgotten to explain. I can chime in with some questions we're getting in the in the Q&A. Um, I think it would be really helpful for folks to understand a little bit more about the risk levels. Um, it looks like uh, somebody is asking whether one in 100,000 is the base level of no cancer risk. And that's not quite right, right? I mean, there are plenty of people who live in one in a million or, or less risk. Um, so can we talk about kind of the thresholds um, that we have for considering something is problematic and kind of, you know, how we think about these risks? Yes, sure, sure, sure. So there, there's definitely a long history with these risk thresholds. Um, and I, I do um, encourage folks to, to read our methodology, which goes into this a little bit um, in our main story. But essentially, um, the EPA sort of included some um, or, or Congress, sorry, um, included some some pretty fuzzy language um, in the original Clean Air Act, which did not mandate the risk level of one in a million to be basically the hard line that chemical companies could not pass. Um, the, EP, the Congress said essentially in the first Clean Air Act of 1970 that it wants to protect the most, you know, the, as many Americans as possible from a risk level um, greater than one in one million. Um, what later happened was the 1989 benzene rule included language that introduced a different risk threshold, which was um, many, many times less protective, and that is the risk threshold of one in 10,000. Um, so now um, environmental activists, um, environmentalists and scientists, and the EPA kind of refers to this range of risk between one in 10,000 and one in a million as the fuzzy bright line. Um, what we selected as the risk threshold that we wanted to use as a cutoff for our map was the level sort of in the um, exponential center of that range, which is one in 100,000, uh, which is a risk level that, again, um, environmental scientists that we spoke with believe is not even protective enough. Um, so is that, um, I want to check with like Ava and Maya, D does that um, seem like a, um, a good way of explaining that? So we selected the one in 100,000, but of course, you know, you could imagine that our map would look uh, substantially different if we had instead chosen to use the one in 1 million threshold. Um, we were interested in being somewhat conservative in our risk estimates um, and, and sort of in the, in the range of risk that we were showing. And the other um, factor is that um, the EPA only models out uh, 50 kilometers around industrial facilities. Um, when you're dealing with most chemicals, um, 50 kilometers out, you have very low or completely insignificant concentrations um, of those chemicals. However, with certain chemicals such as ethylene oxide, it's a very high, highly potent chemical. Um, 50 kilometers out from a facility, you can still have pretty substantial concentrations. And so um, even at that 50 kilometer mark, um, you can have sort of 
people experiencing one in a million um, cancer risk. Um, so uh, ultimately, the the risk the risk ranges are are somewhat confusing, and um, that's why we feel that it's it's useful to um, to to discuss kind of the one in ten thousand mark as sort of the EPA's um, what the EPA considers unacceptable. Um, however, that many uh, individuals who we've interviewed believe that the one in a million mark is the uh, appropriate um, risk benchmark. And for what it is worth, experts do say that one in 10,000 is too risky for people. To work, yes, exactly. Right? Exactly. That's it. So, and we have been interested in places that are doing whole big stories on places that are like one in 42,000, one in 20 something thousand. So one in 10,000 certainly should not be your cutoff for, you know, being interested. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's a couple more questions involving uh, the data. One is uh, from Mark. Uh, oh, that was just answered by Ava. I'll, I'll let Ava have, have just answered that question. Hi, Mark. Uh, uh, so, okay, we've got one from Jacqueline. Nobody's answered yet. Uh, uh, can you talk a bit more about those one cell hotspots? Are they worth investigating or reporting? Or are they more like noise? Um, I wouldn't consider them noise <laughs> because I do think that they're interesting. I think that they are less interesting than multi-cell hotspots. Um, um, and, you know, I think that, um, again, it's, it's always possible that our map is not encapsulating the full scope of the pollution that the industrial plants in our analysis are emitting. Um, uh, plants are supposed to, for example, um, uh, report their startup shutdown malfunctions, um, releases, for example, any accidental leaks, but they don't always. Um, and so it could be a useful place to just sort of do a little bit of reporting ground, see if people are bothered by the emissions of that plan. But I would say that if you are between, you know, looking into a one cell hotspot and a multi-cell hotspot, I would certainly go um, for the multi-cell hotspot. Um, there's another question about the disconnect between RECI risk levels and the permit requirements of EPA and states for those chemicals. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so, yeah, interestingly, um, many of the companies that we asked for comment when we published our first story in MAP told us, well, we are not violating any permit requirements. Um, and based off of their reported emissions alone, that is in many cases correct. However, um, even still, even with their permitted, um, even again, staying within their permitted emissions, um, if you actually do the modeling, they are in some cases, for example, Huntsman, um, elevating cancer risk above levels that the EPA, the agency considers unacceptable. So that is a disconnect that is a result of a regulatory framework that does not sort of, you know, uh, connect, right, the state and federal um, sort of what the state governments are permitting and what the federal government has said is an acceptable range of risk. And that is, you're, you're right to call it a disconnect because it is one. Looks like the reporters are answering uh, some other uh, questions on here, but I'd love to move along to a little bit more of our shoe leather efforts. We'll certainly uh, get back to the, uh, the data. Um, but, you know, Ava, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about um, our storytelling choices and and taking, you know, this tool, which is really just a starting point and trying to, you know, figure out how it is impacting people and and start to hold government and industry accountable. So do you want to talk through that process? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we, you know, the first step for kind of telling a story, I think, with this app is kind of understanding the model, um, which is why these questions are really helpful. And uh, I think Layla's overview gives, you know, a good sense of kind of what it can provide. Um, but the next step we found is actually just verifying these emissions data. And I see that there's a question about that in the chat that's relevant. So, you know, in, in some stories, you know, you might approach kind of who you're writing about later in the process. In this case, we really recommend if you're writing about a hotspot or a group of facilities, and we did this for um, you know, the stories we have that are about to come out and the main story that we, that we published alongside the map, uh, contacting these facilities you know, early and often and asking them to confirm that the data they submitted to the federal government uh, on which this map is based is accurate. And that's because all of this data is self-reported. Um, and it's supposed to be looked over uh, by the federal government. There's supposed to be a quality assurance process. 
Um, you know, obviously, uh, one could argue that it's in the company's own interest uh, not to report data that would make them look, uh, you know, really bad. There's a, you know, a transparency incentive uh, built into the database. Uh, however, we found, you know, all kinds of, of errors, um, which we sussed out and, and corrected, especially for the, the largest facilities. So as a first step, we recommend going to the company, asking them to confirm the data, even if you don't know whether or not you're writing, writing a story. Um, they can update the data anytime with the EPA, which we would then, you know, update if notified in, in our own app. And also letting them know that it appears that based on the data they reported, there's an elevated cancer risk in the area so that they have a chance to kind of, you know, respond and understand that kind of, you know, initial claim as you're working through the story. Um, you know, the next step we recommend is also kind of digging into state and local data. So the way this whole system works is, you know, we're, we're making this map based on federal data, but the EPA delegates much of its authority um, and certainly all of the permitting process to states, local and, and tribal government. Uh, partners. So uh, often they have their own air emissions data. And in some cases, you can use that data to um, supplement, uh, maybe to even tell uh, a sharper story. Um, there might be gaps in the data, which is, uh, you know, a story on its own and something that EPA sources have confirmed, uh, you know, both with us and in the many reports they've produced is just a, a major problem. Um, you know, the data is itself like kind of part of the story we found. And, uh, so it's, it's really worth just like digging in and figuring out what is and isn't available um, and how you're gonna frame the story around that kind of right away. Uh, you know, once you kind of have those requests out and have that going as you're localizing, you know, a story around, you know, a particular area or hotspot, uh, it's also great, of course, to kind of blanket that area with shoe leather, shoe leather reporting. Um, you know, we kind of get into this in our reporting recipe, uh, but uh, everything from uh, calling local community groups, uh, you know, church leaders, um, you know, officials in the area, uh, political, uh, you know, everyone from lobbyists who work with industry to um, state legislators, uh, to teachers, uh, to concerned parents. Uh, there's often environmental advocacy groups uh, already present, active and thriving in a lot of the hotspots that we've identified. And uh, they're often doing their own research, their own air monitoring, and can be incredible resources to lean on. Um, and that we've, you know, found, uh, you know, to be, you know, beyond valuable sources. And, uh, you know, as, you know, finally, I guess the last step I would say, if, if, if there is a recipe for doing this, is just putting out a lot of records requests as well. Um, you know, TRI and EPA data is just one source of data. Um, someone mentioned in the questions, you know, what about OSHA data? Um, that's something that we've pulled for some of our stories. Uh, you can also reach out to like local fire departments. Uh, there's emergency planning like data that, that uh, facilities are supposed to keep, you know, reports of the amount of chemicals they have on hand in case of emergencies or spills or leak. Uh, that could be a really good way to kind of ground truthing what you have available. Uh, permits in terms of construction and zoning can also give a sense um, of waste and, and uh, also relationships with local officials. Um, and lastly, I would say like digging into the health effects is obviously key. Um, you know, this map and this pollution is meaningful because it's it's causing real harm um, and, and real health effects in people's lives. And while obviously we're only showing estimates, um, you know, between uh, tumor registries, which are sometimes useful, although measured in a different way, we, got, we did get a question on that, and um, talking to uh, city officials who may have conducted their own health studies and research, and also looking at lower level health effects like asthma, uh, not just cancer, which our map shows, but um, you know, other, indi other indicators that there may be a pollution problem like asthma, um, or uh, difficulty breathing, uh, COPD, um, autoimmune diseases, uh, all of those are, are really key to dig into. Uh, so I would say those are the kind of really big picture things that uh, we would recommend, you know, getting started on as you're rounding out this reporting. Maya, you're up. Uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about the way that you have conducted outreach around this project. Um, survey for those who live and work near these facilities, uh, the mailers, and opportunities for local tip collaboration. For sure. I'm really excited to be with all of you and talk about this. Uh, we've been steeped in it for a while, so it's fun to be able to share and uh, brainstorm ideas with you all in the chat. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the things that I was working on as we were uh, kind of launching this was 
talking to people in hotspots across the country to just really do some deep listening and understand the questions that they had. Um, and we started hearing repeated questions. And so in conjunction with the map, we also published a service post um, that has kind of frequently asked questions. So as you're doing this reporting, if you hear questions that come up a lot, feel free to point people to that. Um, we hope it can be a helpful resource. Um, and then after we've published, we've been hearing from a lot of people across the country. Someone asked about the small grid cells and we actually heard from someone in one of those small grid cells who like lives in a place where the estimated cancer risk is three times average. Um, and upon talking to them in an interview, they mentioned a lot of other types of nuisances or pollution. So I know we mentioned this in the map and uh, Ava and Leila mentioned this, but we really see this as a starting point. So I definitely think it's worth reaching out to people, even if it's small cell, because you might learn about other types of pollution or nuisances that um, the community has been living with for a long time that maybe state agencies or local officials haven't adequately responded to. Um, so yeah, that's a note on that. And then local tip collection efforts. So we put out this call out uh, like we do often with our stories to hear from residents and really understand how uh, this is affect how the, you know, regulatory failures are affecting people and have been for the last couple of decades. And so um, we've heard from over 315 people at this point um, and have gotten dozens of emails. We're working on some follow-up stories, but we're probably not going to be able to uh, individually interview everyone who's written in. And so if you all are interested in localizing stories, um, please feel free to like uh, email talksmap at propublica.org and we can um, keep you in mind in January once we kind of wrap up the next couple of stories we have and we could see if you all are interested in getting some of the tips that that we're not going to be able to have long conversations with folks about. Um, we'd love to pass those along. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we're doing on that front and hope to be able to collaborate with you all on that tip handoff in the future. Um, so we will uh, go shortly to the Q and A. Um, do we want to briefly touch on the chromium um, kind of complicated chromium issue with the map because you guys might encounter that, and you know it's worth understanding a little bit about it uh, from our reporters. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll jump in there. So one of the most kind of toxic chemicals and, and carcinogens that often really drives the risk is, is known as hexavalent chromium. Uh, it was made famous in the movie Aaron Brockovich. Uh, it was found in the water in Hinkley, California. And uh, it has a cousin called trivalent chromium, uh, which is not associated uh, with any cancer effects. Uh, and one of the really frustrating things about the EPA's reporting system is that it lumps together hexavalent chromium, highly toxic carcinogen, with trivalent chromium, which you know might have some issues, but is certainly not uh, a major driver of cancer risk as chromium or chromium compounds. And facilities, even if they wanted to, have no way of kind of distinguishing, uh, telling us, telling the EPA, how much of which part of that they're emitting. So the EPA's workaround to this is assigning um, what it assumes based on the industry category and how much you know a certain type of industry like aerospace or chrome plating uh, might emit a kind of toxicity weight. So it'll say, okay, this chrome plating facility, we know from the industrial processes that it performs, we expect about 30% of the total chromium compounds to be hexavalent chromium. Um, and that toxicity weight is, you know, based in, based in science, it's a best effort, but it, it's ultimately a guess. And so what's really tricky is you end up with facilities that might be massively overweighted, um, where it looks like they're re releasing, you know, far more of this highly toxic chemical than they are, and facilities that might be, might be underweighted. And so we have notes with all of those facilities that release chromium on our map, uh, you know, letting people know about how the EPA's reporting system works and encouraging them to just go to the facility very early in the reporting process and see if they can provide you with additional documentation, um, you know, that shows or, or refutes or provides more context into actually how much of that chromium is toxic. All right, um, I, I'm gonna delve into uh, some of the questions that we got prior to uh, this uh, because they're good and I think they can be useful to a lot of people. Um, the first one is from Bruce um, who asks, the data ranges in intensity on the map. As we report on this, is there guidance as to which spots, if any, are not intense enough to include in the story? I'm trying to cover an entire state and I'm afraid if I list all the locations, people will just tune out due to info overload. Um, we talked a little bit about this, but I'd love to hear from you guys, you know, what your, what your kind of uh, judgment is on, you know, what is not intense enough or, or 
you know, to, to include. To me, it I sort mean, of depends I, on what people on the oh, ground sorry. are saying, right? No, Le Layla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I totally, I would agree with that. I would say if, if, uh, if folks nearby are um, complaining a lot about a particular source, even if it doesn't look terribly bad on our map, uh, there could be more happening that our map doesn't capture. And so it's probably worth examining. Um, and, you know, in certain cases, however, there could be chemicals that residents are not aware of because they are colorless and odorless. Um, all industrial chemicals are different and some of them are much easier to perceive than others. Benzene, for example, smells like gasoline, so you can't really miss it. Um, but ethylene oxide is a lot harder to know uh, whether or not you're being exposed to it. So I would say that in those cases, it might be useful to um, take a look at what the trends line are, trend lines are for a particular company. Is it getting a lot worse? Did its emissions crash to zero in the past three years? Um, you know, those are the types of questions, like, is, you know, is it sort of stagnant and, and continuously bad? Are they adding new chemicals to the toxic soup? And one thing that I also really like to do is um, a lot of times if you do a click, a Quick, quick clip search, you can um, tell whether or not a facility is going to be expanded in the near future. And so that can also kind of be an interesting news peg sometimes to say, well, we expect this facility or this area to sort of experience even more pollution in the near future. And so then you sort of have an avenue for impact. Also recommend like looking at the facilities through the lens of the EPA's enforcement and compliance database, because you might see um, bad actors, you know, they are only releasing so much, but they have a huge history of violations. And that's obviously uh, you know, really interesting to dig into as well. One other thing I'd recommend from the community standpoint is to potentially go to local Facebook groups or Reddit, subreddits, et cetera, and do searches by the name of the facility or by pollution. Um, if people are complaining a lot and have been for a while, it could be interesting or even requesting complaint records from the state environmental agency to see if people have been um, calling in or writing in a lot, uh, complaining about it. So, yeah. These are all really good suggestions. Thank you guys. Um, we've got a question. Uh, Maya, you might be able to handle this one. It's from Christian who says, what, organi what organizations exist to assist rural typically underrepresented low-income areas in reporting and maintains accurate measurements in the areas surrounding these hotspots? Where would a concerned citizen start to gain some real actionable traction? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, a story to, is going to be coming about this soon, but air monitoring is one of the best ways to kind of understand what's really in the air. Um, and historically, the EPA has not had a robust budget for that to be done on the local level. Um, but we have seen instances in the past where when residents are faced with this, they've uh, kind of advocated to their local environmental agency or federal agency of like, you know, let's get some air monitoring and, and see what's going on. And I think that will give you your best measurement. And I think even if in rural or, you know, urban areas, um, we've seen uh, communities that have pushed for air monitoring have a better sense for, you know, what's really in the air that they're breathing. And just to explain a little bit about kind of who to hold accountable here, um, state agencies are the ones that permit polluters um, and they're the ones that would, you know, come crack down on, on facilities if they're emitting past their limits. Um, but the EPA's regional offices have just as much power um, to, to do some community air monitoring. So it's both, um, you know, the state agency and the EPA regional offices that if air monitoring is not being done in a neighborhood, um, you know, the buck stops at both of them and they should, you know, both be asked about it. Okay, we have uh, another question here um, about uh, going to the polluting facilities. How would you approach the polluting company in a way that would likely end up with them responding to the story? Uh, this is James in Louisville, uh, where there is a welding facility that puts a lot of nickel in the air around a busy apartment complex. Ideally, uh, James would like to have that facility explain how it happens. 
Yeah, that's that's a really great question. I'll I'll grab that one. Um, so I think I mentioned, you know, you can obviously always send a kind of boilerplate email. There's context to like who the environmental health and safety manager is actually within the EPA's own TRI database. So those might be depending on the size and scope of the facility, you know, a good person to reach out to. But it's also totally possible that you send that email and you don't get any response or they feel like you're just trying to write a, a got you story and not just trying to actually understand what's going on. So another way in as a first step that I'd recommend is also trying to find, you know, whether or not the workers are unionized, kind of talking to the local union, seeing if there's people there who might be able to con con connect you with, you know, employees or former employees that can help you just understand, like, what's the actual industrial process going on here? Why do they need this chemical? Why are they using it? Um, you know, is it inextricable from, you know, what they have to make? Or is this, you know, a pollutant that's been phased out years ago that they're kind of, you know, uh, emitting an excess, despite the fact that, you know, most other companies in that, you know, industrial category wouldn't be using it anymore. Like, all of those are just so key to, like, know and understand. Um, sometimes uh, a company's emissions might spike because they were paving the road, and they have to include that in terms of, like, the chemicals they were using. So uh, I think that's a really great question, and going to them as soon as possible, uh, and, and with as, you know, open a mind as possible to, to really just get a sense of kind of what's going on and here to learn, um, whether that's through current employees, former employees, uh, the union, uh, reading company literature, uh, you know, sometimes they'll have PDFs if it's a, a big company online that, you know, help you get a sense of what they do, uh, you know, internal magazines and promotional materials, that kind of thing, really helpful. We have reported our way out of stories after having gone to the companies and, and them, you know, noting that their emissions were wrong and them, you know, then saying thank you very much and filing corrections. So, you know, do it early uh, because that could save you a little bit of time. Alex, can I add one thing on that too? Is just yeah. that I, I would recommend asking the facility so if they if they come back and say these emissions are wrong to submit an updated R form in the TRI program because then they're attesting to the federal government that actually what they submitted was incorrect. But and here are updated emissions. Otherwise, it's just kind of like their word, and it's always nice to have that extra layer of someone saying attesting to the federal government that we're doing this right because you know if, if that's a lie then it's fraud so um just pushing facilities to do that if they come back and say it, it, these these are wrong numbers yeah that thank you for reminding it, it's it's worth mentioning that we have not revised our map unless a company does do this revised form so that you know we keep it we keep it honest uh so this is there's another good question here uh Belen asks, does the project contemplate if and which minority groups could be impacted uh, more, uh, more impacted by the pollution? Layla has done a very interesting uh, data analysis on this. Would you like to talk about that? Sure. Yes. So um, RECI data is not only aggregated at in these little grid squares, but it, you can also um, aggregate it at the level of census tracts. And so we did uh, an analysis using the census tract level RECI data, um, and we sort of connected that RECI data with um, census demographic information to try to understand whether minority communities or minority um, majority minority census tracts are experiencing on average more toxic air pollution than um, majority white tracts. And we found that that is in, in fact true, that um, census tracts where the majority of residents are non-white are experiencing uh, approximately 40% more cancer causing um, cancer risk from toxic air pollution than majority white tracks and that predominantly black tracks are experiencing um, more than double the level of cancer risk from um, toxic cancer causing air pollution. Um, and so um, that analysis is not sort of baked into our app per se, but I would say that if you are interested in those questions, then it would be what I usually do actually is I um, take I pull up census reporter and I look up an area and I put that on one side of my screen and then I put the map on the other side of my screen and I try to understand if the places on our map where um, the pollution is the worst um, if those areas are um, what the sort of demographic breakdown is of those areas. That's great. Thank you, Leila. Um, so uh, let's see our next question. Um, what are some of the best ways you've found to connect and build trust with the communities most impacted by this sort of pollution? Would you like to take this one, Maya? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's a great question and something that we've been wrestling with, um, you know, for the last X, six, seven months. Um, I think that some, there's kind of two camps from which we've been 
uh, learning from is that there's some people, as we mentioned earlier, who kind of have known about this pollution, experiencing it, have seen uh, cancer in their families, have seen other types of pollution emitted by these industrial facilities affecting them through asthma and other health issues. Um, and then there's a group of people who we found, like Layla said earlier, who have no idea that this is in their communities. And so um, there's kind of different approaches we take for each of them when, when doing this work. If you if there is kind of a movement and organizing around this, it's worth just, you know, speaking to the community leaders who've been doing this kind of work for a long time, just listening to them, doing community research. So I often check uh, the American Community Survey, which is census data to understand the demographics of the community, whether it's in majority English speaking or other speaking community, um, whether people are online and offline, and then look at how people are organizing there to really meet them where they are and to um, ensure that whatever questions you're asking is accessible to the people being impacted. Um, for the people who haven't heard about this information before or are unaware of the pollution, it can often be a shock when you're telling them. So kind of just, I would, I would recommend just trying to bring together people in a group conversation with somebody who's well-trusted and um, just, yeah, having one person's buy-in, someone to vouch for you, and then kind of explaining, here's what we've learned. Um, I've similarly done something that Layla did earlier, which is sharing my screen and kind of walking people through the map and answering questions they have. And that's a, that tends to kind of engender trust. But yeah, I'd say that obviously the people impacted are why we did this in the first place. Um, and they have a lot to teach us. Um, so they are experts in their own right about the conditions on the ground. They have receipts to hold companies accountable in some instances and government agencies. So just really um, treating people like the experts they are um, has helped us build trust. Absolutely. Um... Paul is asking uh, what toxic dumps, brownfields, or abandoned industrial sites are in our area, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, like steel plants, chemical, plastic, sugar, or water, and sewage treatment facilities are in my area. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and if I didn't already emphasize it uh, already, we, you know, we definitely recommend, like, we're just looking at air pollution from industrial sources. And there are so many other types of pollution, uh, so many other types of cancer causing pollution that are also being, you know, are supposed to be regulated by the, by the EPA. Um, and so looking at their other databases, uh, you know, there's uh, places on the EPA uh, and the EPA's kind of whole data set where you can search brownfield sites, uh, Superfund sites. Uh, you can look at uh, information collected from RICRA and uh, TRI, which we just looked at the air kind of data also collects amazing water information uh, which is, you know, allegedly, um, uh, you know, easy, to, easier to measure than air. Uh, so you might even have, you know, an easier time looking at water and uh, information about on-site and off-site releases. And then on top of that, there's also a database called the National Emissions Inventory, um, which uh, states submit to the federal government and often also, um, you know, will include some of their monitoring data and uh, data about kind of shipyards and ports and, you um, diesel trucks, uh, that's all represented in the National Air Toxics Assessment, which can be another really good resource to kind of check against our map since, uh, you know, automotive emissions are such a big source of pollution as well and something to consider. If you're looking at a hot spot, you see five highways going through it. It's not just the cumulative risk of uh, the four facilities uh, that were big enough to report uh, to this database that we visualized. It's also the risk from all of these highways, uh, from small metal foundries that might not even have to report to the federal government. Uh, from a train that might be going through the neighborhood. And so really thinking about the cumulative impact and the way that that affects an entire neighborhood, uh, I think is really key to localizing these stories and also showing the harm. Uh, there's a great uh, question here uh, from Danielle. What can we do if the EPA doesn't have the full picture, such as in El Paso with the air pollution from Ciudad Juarez? Yeah, I can take this one because we've been working on a story that will also be coming soon. Um, I, that's also on the border of the US and Mexico. Um, Mexico does have its own uh, database about toxic air pollution, but they don't um, include all of the same chemicals that the US does. Uh, for example, ethylene oxide, which as we note in our national story is responsible for most of the uh, industrial toxic air pollution cancer risk in our country. Um, and so, you can look at that database, but yeah, I think there's some kind of blind spots and it's an interesting question to raise, right? If like this air pollution doesn't see borders uh, that we've drawn up. And so 
what's happening to people on both sides of the border as where the U.S. is housing these industrial facilities that are putting toxic air pollution in the air. So not a fully satisfying answer. It's something we're grappling with as well, but um, I'd be happy to chat more and send that uh, database of that Mexico has over after as well. Someone is asking how they can get uh, photos and videos to us of uh, dirty flares coming from a facility just north of Corpus Christi. Um, I would say probably email us, right, at toxmap at propublica.org. Um, that reaches the entire reporting team. Um, by the way, uh, if, if you have any additional questions or you run into any other roadblocks, you can reach out to us there. Um, and, and most importantly, if you do a story uh, and you actually get some impact out of it, please let us know uh, by emailing us there. We're also gonna look into other ways that um, we can keep in touch with some of you guys uh, as you continue to do your reporting. Um, so we still have some more questions here. Uh, let's see. I live in the city of Whittier, California, and I believe we have a highly toxic site on the corner of Whittier Boulevard and Washington Boulevard that affects a four mile radius. I believe the site also has con contaminated our water tables at the site. My, concern, my concerns are that we drink water provided by our own wells. I wanna know how I can find information that would indicate the site is in fact contaminating our drinking water. I can take a stab at this one and then I'll kick it to you, Ava, because um, this is a question we've been getting a lot of people who've been writing into us with tips. Um, there are other databases that you can check. Uh, TRI actually also has, if you go to their, in, in the reporting recipe, we have a, a link to TRI and you can kind of separate out air releases and water releases. So you can see if the facility is releasing water uh, or chemicals in through the water. Um, you might also want to check with, I think, with like local health departments would be good for this one or local environmental agencies. They often put out alerts um, when there's some drinking water issues. But Eva, I want to give you a chance to answer too in case I there's anything I didn't cover. Okay. No, it's great. So we've got nine minutes left, everyone. Uh, ask your questions now. Okay, good. We just got one from Rebecca. How do we know that the EPA takes the time to verify changes to emissions in Form R's? From industrial companies. Ava. Um, so the EPA uh, does have a quality assurance process, but obviously there's, you know, 21,000 companies uh, that report the toxics release inventory. I mean, that's the largest, I think, inventory of, of toxic releases in in the world. Um, so it's not, you know, humanly possible, and they haven't yet developed some, you know, sort of machine learning algorithm to actually check that what the companies are saying is true. Um, what they try to do is use kind of the incentive that a company has to, you know, legally certify. Uh, they have to actually sign, an official has to sign uh, that they attest that the emissions are accurate. But enforcement of the database and like enforcement if, if your emissions turn out to be inaccurate later, uh, we found is, is, is pretty spotty. Um, so uh, that's what we think the best thing is to just triple check with the companies, even though it's supposed to have been, you know, verified and checked with the EPA as you're working on the story. And, you know, all of the reporting we've done, uh, to be clear, is done after, after those checks with the companies, after they say, yeah, we are releasing um, this many pollutants. Um, and while we did hear back from some companies that said, oh, you know, we made an error here or there, and the errors were you know, various uh, scales. Uh, some of the errors were, you know, quite small, and, you know, others did, you know, affect how a company looked on the map. We did hear back from lots of companies that said, yeah, this is, this is how much we are um, releasing to the best of our knowledge uh, using reasonable estimates. And, um, uh, you know, that's why that, that should definitely be the first step because you know, the short answer to your question is we don't, we don't know that they're checking. I have one last, I have a question for the audience, uh, which is, um, are you running into any obstacles within your newsroom uh, to being able to report based on our map? And is there anything we can do to help mitigate these obstacles? In the meantime, uh, we've got a question. Uh, somebody is asking, well, what kinds of questions would you ask elected representatives in state legislatures um, and Congress representing these areas?
Uh, yeah, that's a great one. I can I can jump in there too. So we actually made a list of, of some of the questions uh, we recommend uh, that people ask, uh, the things that were kind of guiding us in our reporting. Um, and they include just kind of getting a sense of how the air toxics, the local air toxics program um, works. Uh, you know, you also want to kind of ask it legislators, you know, what kinds of, um, you know, conversations are they having with industry? Um, how much, you know, is industry's voice uh, given a seat at the table um, as opposed to uh, community members? Uh, how does that shape? Uh, the state's legislation. Uh, one thing we've we found, uh, and of course, this is something that anyone who reports on the environment already knows, is you know, regulations differ, um, you know, quite substantially um, from state to state. So, uh, you know, that's the the kind of importance of of really holding um, state officials and these uh, local regulators uh, to account. Um, it's also great to ask about the funding that they've provided to the state agency. Um, how much money they want to put aside for, for things like monitoring the air, which uh, obviously provides much better data than self-reported emissions, and uh, whether or not they're considering the disproportionate impact on communities of color uh, that, you know, across the nation, uh, these, these facilities continue, continue to have when considering new permits uh, and, and other industrial processes in the area. So just to break that down, I think the first part of Ava's answer is really like what you would ask the state agency, who I would say is probably actually the most important body that you're going to want to actually sit down and talk to when you're doing this reporting. And then um, the, the sort of more broad questions about how much are you funding your environmental agency, that would be to your to your congressperson and to your representative and so on. Um, but the state agency, I think like, um, which wasn't exactly, you know, I think that, that they really warrant a real sit down and, and that conversation can be somewhat technical, like, do you model, um, you know, the emissions from plants? What are you looking for when you do your modeling? Do you require environmental impact assessments? Um, but, but those, I found it very helpful to ask the state that I'm investigating those questions and then to compare their answers to that of a different state. Um, some of the sort of more golden examples include Massachusetts and Maine, um, California. And so, you know, sometimes it's useful to be able to say things like, well, um, in this state, they do it this way. Um, why aren't you doing it um, this other way? That that also reminds me of cumulative risk. So I think, in New, is it true that New Jersey might be one of the few or only states that um, looks no, at no. the cumulative? Yeah, Layla, do you want to talk about that actually a little bit? Yeah, so New Jersey passed sort of a landmark law last year that requires permit the permitting authority, the state permitting authority to, um, to consider the pre-existing conditions in an area uh, before permitting new plants. So basically uh, they must assess whether or not an area is already overburdened by toxic pollution before permitting a new plant. It's sort of the first law that gives the permitting authority the power to deny a permit on the grounds uh, that a community is uh, an environmental justice community is an overburdened community. Um, and so that's going to be an interesting law to watch because it's possible that other states sort of follow suit um, and begin adopting these laws. And, and there certainly will be, I think, pressure, and there already is um, at the federal level for the federal EPA to adopt a similar law.